Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Innovator Showcase Pitch Event, powered by Coresight Research. Here's your MC, Stephen Winnick, Senior Analyst with Coresight Research. Thank you for the introduction. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Coresight's Innovator Showcase Pitch Event Series. Today, we'll be discussing the future of retail and look at innovative technologies that are supporting next generation retailing. Over the last year, we have seen the most successful retailers and brands were those who leveraged technology and were able to pivot quickly amid fast changing consumer demand. For today's pitch event, we've selected five growth stage companies. These companies are global, all commercialized products and several working with large retailers and brands, some Fortune 500 companies. Today, attendees will hear about innovations for consumer-centric experiences like digital design and marketing tools. We'll also be hearing from next generation technologies, including merchandising tracking, supply chain optimization, and return reduction. As we get into the pitch competition, I wanted to go over a few ground rules. Each company will have four minutes to pitch, followed by two minutes of judges Q&A. The winner will receive an exclusive Coresight co-branded webinar. Now to review the judges and the moderator, if we move to the next slide here, the pitch will be moderated by Coresight's own CEO and founder, Deborah Weinswig. We've also curated three judges across three diverse backgrounds. We have Rob Mills, EVP and Chief Technology Officer from Tractor Supply. We have David Matthews, Managing Director for RevTech Ventures. And last but not least, we have M Melissa Campanelli, co-founder of Women in Retail Leadership Circle. We have created a judging criteria, which each judges will be evaluating following each pitch. The following five factors, as you see on the screen, will be calculated to determine the judge's winner. We will also be engaging with our audience, so we encourage everyone to vote, and these scores will be factored into the judge's decision as well. And also we're gonna be giving away prizes for audience participation. So please make sure to vote following each pitch competition as we will launch a poll on your screen for you to rate each company along the same criteria. In terms of prizes, you, everyone that votes has a chance of winning one of the following items, a work from home essentials packet, a custom handmade butcher's block from Fifth and Cherry, and an ought to be glam nail kit with all the essentials. We'll also be showing a virtual store tour of New York based show fields, as well as hearing from three emerging retail brands and a short presentation from each. We hope you all come away with an education and potentially opportunities to explore further collaborations with some of these retail tech innovators, as well as these emerging brands. Without further ado, I'll kick it, out, I'll kick it over to Deborah to kick things off. Uh, depending where you are, either snow on the ground or a snowy day here in New York. So first we have five amazing retail technology companies as, Stephanie, as Stephen alluded to, and we also have three emerging brands. With that, I'd love to introduce Sean Snyder, who's a dear friend. And we met a few years ago at the Retail Council of Canada Conference in Toronto. I was immediately drawn to Sean's background as he is a former retailer turned retail technology solutions provider. So whom to better understand the challenges that all of us are facing today. He really has a knack for understanding how he can best help retailers, which culminated in the founding of engagement agents. With that, I'll turn the floor over to Sean, thanks. As a former retailer, I experienced the problem that every retailer has. We're all paying significantly for marketing within our leases, whether it's built into the common area maintenance fees, our gross rent, marketing and promo funds, merchant association fees, or percentage rent. The problem was, it was a nightmare for me to manage. It didn't make sense to have our individual store manager to do it, and I couldn't keep up with it. And every one of our shopping centers wanted our marketing campaigns to promote in order to drive traffic and sales back to our stores or e-commerce channels. However, based on my research, only 10% of retailers take advantage of these benefits, which they significantly pay for. Using an example of the top 10 shopping centers in the United States based on sales per square foot, this is a report summarizing the retailers promoting their marketing campaigns on President's Day, this past President's Day long weekend. There was only 15% of the retailers promoting what was exciting in store. There should have been a lot more. Ultimately, this is costing retailers and shopping centers 
hundreds of billions of dollars every year in lost traffic and sales. So I built a solution. Engagement Agents helps retailers both optimize their leases by helping maximize the marketing opportunities they already pay for each month, to drive more traffic and sales, whether it's in-store or online, help the retailers save measurable amounts of time, money, and resources, while also ensuring their brand and campaign are consistent, current, correct, and compliant with their marketing campaigns. And how we do that is with our software as a service platform, which is turnkey for retailers. We make it easy for retailers to manage, automate, distribute, and track the success of their marketing campaigns within their shopping center's marketing channels to ultimately help the retailers drive more traffic and sales, whether it's in-store or online, to optimize those dollars that they're significantly paying for every month to generate a return on engagement. And these are just some of our featured customers. We're global and local, and you can see we're working with a number of the world's largest retailers rely on engagement agents to help them drive traffic and sales through their shopping centers marketing channels. And here's just some of our success stories. We've been able to help one retailer identify a whopping $26 million a year that they were spending already within their leases for marketing to help them drive more traffic and sales. We've also been able to show other retailers we can both increase their traffic, their sales in store and online, while saving them huge amounts of time, money and resources as compared to doing this work manually the old fashioned way. And as an example, here's an example using a hundred store retail chain. They're paying about a million dollars a year within their marketing costs, within their leases for marketing. They really have four options today. Either they do nothing uh, while their competitors take advantage of it. They have individual store managers handle it, which is time consuming, complex and cumbersome, or they might have a team at head office doing it, which is also time consuming, complex and cumbersome. With collaboration with the retailers, we can show their teams that we can be more effective and generate more ROI than doing this work manually the old fashioned way. And we've also been recognized with numerous awards through different retail organizations. Most recently we were nominated, we awarded one of the top 50 global retail tech startups by World Retail Congress and Retail Week. And that concludes my presentation and I welcome any questions uh, you have. So much, uh, Melissa. I think you have one teed up for Sean. Can you talk a little bit about some of your competitors in the market and how what you offer is different? Uh, sure. So, arguably, the largest competitor for us is actually uh, the retailers uh, with their position that they could do this work uh, manually, as I said. So, on that uh, second to last slide, we've done numerous case studies, and by collaborating with the retailers and complementing their team. We can actually show them that, for example, in the case of the store managers doing this work, that it makes more sense that they can focus on having the store managers sell more on the store floor in, let's say, an hour of time rather than doing this work each individually. Because um, we find a lot of retailers have really left this up to the uh, local stores to manage. And as we all know, the store managers are already overworked. They're dealing with uh, hiring staff, keeping customers safe, keeping the inventory on the floor. Um, so we've been able to help the retailers augment that, take that work off the store managers so they can focus on the store itself and streamline and make that process more efficient for them. Hey, Sean, this is David. What, what's um, kind of the biggest bang for the buck you're able to deliver a retailer by unlocking the marketing they're already paying for? There's a lot of retailers, generally speaking, don't know that they're already paying for these opportunities because they're uh, technically on the real estate or leasing's p l but their marketing opportunities to execute. So in the one example I was referring to earlier, uh, we helped a retailer uh, identify that they were spending about $2,000 a month, which was built into their leases. So again, whether it's through their uh, common area maintenance fees, gross rent, percentage rent, et cetera, but mathematically that worked out to be a whopping $26 million a year that they were missing out on driving traffic and sales and getting ahead of their competition. This is uh, Rob Mills. Um, a great presentation. Uh, retailers today are really, as you know, hyper-focused on data, customer insights around their behaviors. Can your data integrate with uh, retailer CRM tools? Uh, full visibility and transparency. So they have access to all the information and they can tie that back into their own uh, internal tools or we can work with their tools to help them uh, complete the story, if you will. Great, Sean, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. To go to our next presentation from David Klein. 
I had the opportunity to meet Inspectorio when they were really at the beginning of their journey as we were both Hong Kong based. Uh, the opportunity to get to know them better emerged in 2016 as I was a mentor to target tech stars and they were part of our first cohort. Focus and also deep understanding of the supply chain. Uh, David is no stranger to the stage and always really leaves me feeling invigorated. Uh, with that, I'll turn the stage over to David. Thanks for joining us. All right, so I'll start with the problem. Um, if we see on the top left, uh, from top to bottom, you have an organization like a vendor or a factory that is onboarded into a retailer's ecosystem that has to go through a vetting process. After that vetting process and going through all of the different checklists, they go into pre-production, production, inspections, a distribution center inspections, returns, and a, ideally get also customer review data in. And then within the production process, there's also the need for uh, tracking not only the processes of production, but also production itself. All of that end-to-end -end process of the product today is done, as you can see at the bottom, through very manual processes, lacking of visibility, there's lack of standardization, data is not being consolidated. It's very difficult to collaborate across all of that process between retailers, vendors, and factories, and there's a lack of actionable insights. If we look on the top right, the relationship is very linear between retailers, vendors, and factories. So all of that end-to-end -end, um, coordination that needs to take place, it's also happening in silos. If we can move to the next slide, please. What uh, Inspectorio has done is to basically transform that relationship into a relationship that takes place within a network. So it's interconnected and all of it takes place on a single platform. So when we look at the graph on the right, at the bottom, you'll see that all of that cycle end to end is now taking place within the Inspectorio platform. So we automate the whole process end to end. We provide analytics to all of the different stakeholders, factories, vendors, brands, and retailers. We leverage machine learning to start predicting and also through integration, send the data back to all of the different stakeholders. What that unleashes, if we can see at the bottom, is that all of the data is being consolidated in one place. We connect, automate, and optimize all of the operations. It provides vendors and factories actionable insights. They know exactly where the risk areas are. They maximize the resources and focus on those attention areas. Through machine learning, we can generate preemptive uh, instead of reactive. So a lot of preventative and prescriptive insights improve the relationships and collaboration. And overall, what this means is that you can have a reduction in all of your overhead costs. And that transitions both factories and vendors, as well as brands and retailers, to higher quality and therefore less returns and more compliance. Um, some uh, key metrics, uh, we work with uh, 23 uh, of the largest brands and retailers around the world. They are some of the largest uh, organizations in the US and Europe. Um, we have more than 5,000 customers. That's uh, around 15,000 network participants. So we have the largest, uh, one of the largest networks between factories, vendors, and brands and retailers. Uh, and we've had a 120% growth year over year. Uh, the greatest opportunity for growth is in the factory and vendor segment. As you can see, uh, for one retailer, there's hundreds of vendors and thousands of factories. We're launching a new product at the end of 2021 tailored for factories and vendors. We've also moved and expanded into the food vertical. So you can already imagine in consumer goods, the total addressable market. Now that's been expanded into food. Um, we've received investment from Techstars Ventures, um, which is one of the leading VCs in the world, and also uh, Fortune 100 um, companies. We are a team of over 145 and growing. Our founding team uh, has a decade of experience in supply chain, and we have a 100% in-house product development team. We're 100% a product development company uh, that continues to grow exponentially. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm open for questions. Uh, thank you. Retailers are always, as you mentioned, we're looking for ways to reduce and improve kind of the predictability of the supply chain. You know, with your platform that you shared and with COVID over the last 12 months, how's your platform kind of enabled retailers to get more predictable with just the ups and downs of what they've seen in volumes related to COVID? Yeah, uh, two things. So our solution has been extremely useful uh, in the context of COVID in two areas. Number one, uh, being able to operate remotely. 
So the fact that you don't need to have actual people going into facilities to carry out all of your activities of inspections or auditing, you can actually leverage the platform to empower these organizations to do self-assessments or self-inspections. So all of our clients were actually able to ship and ship on time when many of other retailers that haven't gone through this digitized and automated process struggled with that. Second, when it comes to production visibility, one of the things that COVID had uh, it made a lot of the retailers recognize is that they didn't know, they didn't have that pulse on their supply chain. How many orders I have and where, and the ability to have that direct visibility allows you to have that pulse on your supply chain, therefore to be more resilient and to take actions a lot uh, better in these circumstances. Question: This is Melissa Campanelli. Um, so, a lot of our, a lot of my uh, constituents and, and women that I speak to all the time are really interested in, in scalability and how the vendors that they're working with are planning to grow or or change or or implement anything new. Can you talk about some innovations that you're looking at for the future? Yeah, so, well, the greatest innovation is we have a proprietary algorithm that allows you to understand what's the risk of a given facility. Understanding of risk in the past has always been done very subjectively and today you're leveraging data for that. And then point number two is a, a production tracking system that has truly been built based on the learnings of what the failures of other production tracking systems have done in the past and built truly as a network. I just wonder what the biggest scaling challenge has been for Inspectorio. You've done magnificent scale, but what's been the biggest challenge? Um, I would say that um, the biggest challenge has really been able to make sure that the factories uh, have a product that they are wanting to continue to scale internally, right? So we started tailoring to retailers and generating as much value as possible to them because through them, we get their suppliers and their factories. Now our shift has started to move to making sure that we have a product that truly starts delivering value to vendors and factories because that's where we have our greatest opportunity for growth. Again, for one retailer, we have hundreds of factories and vendors. So um, that's what I feel has been our challenge and now we're addressing as best as possible. Great, David, thank you so much. It was fantastic and uh, looking forward to continued success. With that, we'll uh, turn the floor over to Navjeet from Newmine. He is one of the people I probably speak to more than anyone else, including my family. He's passionate about reducing returns for retailers and driving ROI. What we found most interesting was the, the significant opportunity, especially as it related to sustainability and reducing returns and, and really to help educate retailers. In addition, he has a deep consulting background, and this really does help him see the industry as an ecosystem of partners. And he's really forever trying to connect all the dots for the Omni win. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Navji. Thanks for joining us. So, thank you, Deborah, for having me. And thanks for the great introduction. I didn't know you were spending more time with me. <laughs> thank you. So, uh, <clears throat> Newmine, our core mission at Newmine is to ensure retailers thrive in a transforming world. And we are very laser focused on returns reduction. The consumers have been spoiled with the fast, free, easy shipping, and now fast, free, easy returns as well. E-commerce has been growing significantly over the last decade, and the pandemic further accelerated that growth. Returns has been the dirty little secret in the retail industry. Not only does it impact the financial metrics like the top line, the bottom line, and the gross margins, but it impacts the customer loyalty and environmental sustainability as well. For those who have heard uh, Walmart's earnings of Q4 as of this morning, Walmart's e-com grew by 69%, but they still could not beat their earnings. Imagine by just reducing returns by a tiny 10%, it could have added millions to their bottom line and for any retailer out there. So what we brought to the market is Chief Returns Officer. It is a SaaS AI machine learning based platform, laser focused on helping retailers understand the root cause of returns in the early part of the selling season. And we don't stop there. We in fact prescribe the corrective actions to take so returns can be reduced. Ultimately the goal is 
to make the retailer workforce as productive as possible, giving them the insights in an automated fashion and bringing those to their inbox and all they need to do is take action. So under, under the covers, we leverage the retailer's data, the data coming from social media, product reviews, and we run it through our natural language processing algorithms and getting them to that real, real insight. It's an automated way of getting to the insights and getting to the corrective action. And we just don't stop there. We in fact take it further by ensuring there is collaboration and accountability of that action to be taken. A very simple example, but it still gets overlooked. What was customer promised when they were during the shopping journey was the color on the left, but when they actually got the dress, it was on the right. And studies have shown that at least two thirds of the retailers are under the control of the retailer, but still they are not able to take action because returns are no single person's problem in the retail, uh, within the retailer. And getting to the root cause is where the real, real issue is. And that's where chief returns officer platform comes into the picture. So if you look at the bottom left, uh, if you look at the bottom, you will see the actions that our software is recommending to reduce returns. Just another example, Returns can be due to a variety of reasons, starting with the, the product, the quality, the fit and service and so on. And it's humanly impossible to chase all of those issues without a software like Chief Returns Officer. Uh, we get retailers up and running in 30 days and uh, show them results within the first 60 to 90 days with a very quick ROI. We've been featured in Wall Street Journal as of last week, and uh, we were one of the innovators in the return space. And uh, we were highlighted alongside Walmart and Amazon on how they are treating returns by just letting the customer keep it. But for a typical retailer, that is not a sustainable practice. This is how we differentiate our solution. Retailers absolutely have to manage the returns, the reverse logistics and disposition but that's all reactive. Newmine is the only one who is proactive in tackling the issue of returns reduction. Our, motto, our belief is the best return is the one that never has to happen. Thank you. Thanks, Namjeet, that was fantastic. I think, uh, Rob, you've got a question? I sure do. So we talked, uh, you shared quite a bit about um, your solution and sustainability. And, you know, in today's world, ESG sustainability is really key. Can you talk a little bit more about how your solution has in, in enabled that or improved sust sustainability and maybe even provide an example? Sure, ab ab absolutely. So, uh, Rob, the way we look at sustainability is, hey, is the product ending up in a landfill? What is the carbon emission impact? What is the impact you know, in terms of the packaging, reverse logistics, et cetera? And we've already proven that if you can reduce returns by a mere 10%, and I'm talking just 10%, right? All of those uh, you know, goods going to the landfill or the corrugate needed to ship the product back or you know, the UPS and the DHLs and the FedEx shipping the product back, and again, any retailer who is focused on ESG measurement, they can clearly track this all the way back to returns reduction. Thank you. Sure. Navjit, this is David. Um, so does the retailer have to hire a dedicated resource for this? Because I see this as a recommendation engine that requires action on the retailer's part. Do they have somebody in a role that's already tasked for this? Mm -hmm. or is it yeah, so, so David, uh, uh, we are a pure software company and we provide recommendations to the existing workforce of the retailer. Today, I mean, for example, we're not asking them to add any additional headcount. And these corrective actions are gonna be taken by, let's say, uh, web merchandiser, their buying team, their sourcing team, marketing team. So we're making their existing workforce highly, highly productive. Thank you. Sure. I don't know if we have time for another quick one. Um, yeah. So um, 
several several folks have a, have been asked this question. I'm going to jump in as well. How has your business changed because of COVID, and do you see it sort of uh, maintaining uh, the changes that you saw going forward? So, Melissa, as I indicated earlier, pandemic accelerated e-commerce, and as e-commerce has grown, returns are growing at the same pace. And our goal is, even if we can just flatten the curve of returns by a tiny bit, I mean, it's it, it impacts not only the financial bottom line of the retailers, sustainability, as I answered to Rob as well, and on top of it, hey, no customer is eager to go and purchase in anticipation, hey, I'm going to be returning this product, right? So it's all about, at the end of the day, customer satisfaction, customer loyalty as well. And uh, this is this has been a dirty little secret of retail, and nobody has been willing to take an action just because it's not easy. And that's the reason we brought our software, and we called it Chief Returns Officer, because that position does not exist in retail today. Hmm. We appreciate it. I guess the dirty little secret's out. Pitch, uh, we're going to share a short video from a company, Showfields, based in New York, that is reimagining the retail experience. Retail stores are continuing to close in droves. Retail is dying. Rent to retail. Retail apocalypse. Retail is not dead. It's evolving. Retail as a service. This unique set of ingredients creates an experience which just makes you want to share it. And it's no wonder that Showfields is becoming the place that brands see as made to carry their story. Just an example of a store operating today, but a potential model of what reimagined retail could look like more broadly with a mix of interesting direct to consumer brands and technology to create this immersive experience. Now, handing it back over to Deborah to get into our next pitch. Great. Thanks so much, Stephen. And uh, I've always enjoyed spending time at Showfields, it's uh, an adventure like no other. Uh, so with that, I'll uh, hand it over to Willie in a second. Um, I've known, as I went through and kind of put this together, I'm like, I've known Willie for almost two decades, uh, starting from his early days of Profit Logic when I was at City and we had uh, gotten to know them well. He then joined Oracle and uh, after the acquisition of Profit Logic, and I was one of the founding members of the Oracle Retail Strategy Council, so continue to spend time with Willie. And then from there, he joined another company who we advised, which was Revionics, and then CI Value, who's also an innovator intelligence uh, client of Core Sites. So he's been at four amazing companies and had a significant impact on them all. So I assume, uh, as much as we know NextSite as well, but that NextSite is destined for greatness with Willie on board. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Willie. So, um... I, uh, my name is uh, is Will Rodstein. I'm, I'm the chief commercial officer here at Nexite. Nexite, we started uh, our journey three years ago, uh, and we are going live with our first uh, store next month. So these are very exciting times for us. So what do we do? In a nutshell, in a nutshell, we bring merchandise to life. We are the first to truly connect merchandise to the cloud, transforming uh, passive products, passive retail products that we have today into active digital communicators. Data automatically flows in from the merchandise, telling us the complete life story of the products from the moment they are made at the, back to, uh, the factory 
all the way to the store and even beyond our vision is to reach the customer's home as well. With live merchandise, retailers can really bring the magic back to retail and have, you know, get how did, how did the show feels, uh, video say the experience you want to share. This is certainly what we want to help retailers to achieve uh, with us. Next slide. So why connecting merchandise? Why, why is this a must today? Think about the omni-channel experience. Omni-channel is all about connectivity, but the simple fact is that in a world that is increasingly connected, where consumers are connected, Physical retail is not. There is a disconnect between the merchandise and the retailer, and also between the merchandise and the customers. As a retailer, this means that you only get limited data on what's happening with the merchandise at any point in time. Well, what are the customers trying now, for example? What are they buying after they're trying? As a customer, it leads to friction in their experience. Think as a comparison, uh, a company like Uber and what they have done for, uh, for ordering a taxi. They completely remove friction from the process. You order and pay for your taxi with one click in the app, instead of having to phone and phone and phone again and then pay at the end of the journey. You get continuous updates as, on what's happening all along. And that not just removes friction, but it also removes stress from the process. So how can, how can we bring a similar magic to retail as well? So we believe the secret is connectivity. At Next Size, uh, we have developed our Next Size Connected Merchandise Platform, which is the first to connect your merchandise to the cloud. At the core of the platform, it's a smart Bluetooth tag that is attached to every item and transmit data nonstop, continuously, and without any internal power source. Fixed store readers automatically collect the data and send the, this data to the platform, our cloud platform, software platform that we have developed, and that translates all these readings into meaningful business events and insights that can be leveraged either for the, by the retailer to make better decisions or to provide a memorable experience for the customer. So connectivity will transform the whole value chain. It all starts with true end-to-end -end inventory transparency. Brands can even extend this transparency to collaborate with retail partners. At the store, our solution helps you understand the customer journey. You can understand engagement by the customer. You can understand even the impact of product positioning based on where products are in the store or whether they are hanged or folded. Think something like Google Analytics, but for the physical store. We also help reinvent online and offline shopping with a complete contactless and secure experience. Whatever customers want to do, buy, collect, or return. Finally, you can create an at-home experience as well. Get advice, for, for example, on what to wear based on, based on what's available on, the, on your closet right now and the meetings you have planned for the day. Or make the circular economy a reality, a massive thing today, by being notified if a garment you own, for example, has a value in the resale market and you could put it for sale today. So this is next site. In 2021, we have made connected merchandise possible. Let's bring your merchandise to life and bring the magic back to life, back to retail together. Thank you. Thanks so much, Willie. And uh, with that, I think David, you've got a few questions for Willie. Yeah, Willie is, so is this an RFID solution, RFID tagging? No, no, it's not. We have developed, uh, we, we consider RFID, we are arrived to the conclusion that RFID will never do the sort of continuous item tracking in real time that we want to do. RFID is not a connected device. It's something that you need to scan to get information. Our, our product continuously communicates with no scanning. So it's literally connected to the cloud and therefore you can track all the time what's happening. It uses Bluetooth signals, so standard Bluetooth signals. So it can be read by a smartphone or for the, by the readers that we place on the ceiling of the store. And it can, uh, it also collects energy from those same readers that we are pla placing on the ceiling of the store or can collect energy from your mobile phone. So it's a completely different from RFID. Connected so what are, what are the unit economics of this compared to RFID? So we, we have uh, developed the economics. If you look at the cost of RFID, on operating RFID in fashion, it has three key components. You need an RFID tag, you need a security tag, and you need also the readers that you, you need to buy for the stores. Our total cost of ownership is comparable to those three things combined. So we can provide security, the, the RFID plus continuous measurements, 
and, uh, and continuous readings at a cost comparable to RFID. Um, can, Willie, can you talk a little bit about what the end user or the retailer has to do on the back end to prepare themselves for this system to work? Uh, well, it's well, it's like any system. You may need when you put it in the store, for example, you may need to do some basic integration with like with the point of sale, for example. Once you have that, it depends on the application that you want to do. If you want to enable your customers to do self checkout, for example then you will have to work together with us to develop some sort of app, uh, maybe through your loyalty app, to enable the customers to check out by themselves. If you want to use uh, the Google Analytics capability, then we are providing, we are creating an application that has, is providing daily recommendations for stores managers and store staff to optimize their sales at the store. So from that point of view, it's different than RFID that you need to train your whole team to man, you know, how to scan things and how to do things regularly. Once our tags are in, it's like a website. The data comes in and we can provide you the, the applications to make better decisions every day. Thank you. Willie, uh, great presentation. Thank you. Fascinating technology. You talked a little bit about the connectivity and kind of the, the different components. How about going back to the manufacturer? Is there feedback that's fed to the manufacturer or the, the creator of the product, if that makes sense through your connectivity uh, ecosystem? Feedback from the point of view of uh, where you place the tag or feedback on letting them know what's happening? A little bit, yeah, a little bit of both. So A, the tag is designed to, to be fit at the point of manufacturing. So from there onwards, the, 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 the garment is connected and you can track the progress all, all along the supply chain. If things are late, you can advise the, you can tell the supplier that that's happening. You can also figure out why things are late and where are being uh, delayed because collection of data is, uh, is automatic. There is another interesting angle there for, in terms of counterfeit, a huge issue for the major, for the major brands. As a side benefit of our solution, you also get, uh, you know, a real digital identity for the garment that is, uh, you cannot copy. Our tag comes with a unique identifier from factory. It's encrypted, you cannot read it, you cannot copy it. So if you are, I don't know, Gucci or, or whichever luxury brands, you can, as a customer, you can scan the product and validate that it's a really Gucci product. And if the customers, you know, the suppliers have put products in the gray market, you can even police that and find products that haven't come into the Gucci supply chain, but somehow found their way into the gray market. So it's a great potential just there, you know, on, on the side. Connectivity really changes everything. And that's why, why we are so excited about the potential here. Great, great. thank well, you. Willie, thanks so much. And Rob, thanks for the great question. Uh, with that, we're going to turn it over to our last retail technology company, uh, Camilla Olson, who's the CEO and co-founder of Savitude. Uh, I met Camilla during the second Techstars Target cohort in the summer of 2017. I was instantly drawn to the way she thought about complex problems in retail and how technology could solve for them. She also really had an eye on how to create a platform and bring people together in an ecosystem uh, with a very early focus on diversity and inclusion and really enabling all people to get access to great fitting and great looking product. With that, I'll turn it over to Camilla. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Deborah. I appreciate this opportunity. We founded Savitude as a recommendation technology for e-commerce using body shape, clothing silhouette, and design details as the basics for aesthetics. We proved an 11% lift of sales across millions of people at a top five retailer. But we saw a problem. We had difficulty finding items to recommend for some consumers because no one had designed for their body shape. Lack of the right choices causes consumers to be disappointed and over-serving consumer shapes results in up to 30% of apparel not being sold and then going to the landfill. Next. Sabitude's Design Studio helps brands adapt fashion for all women's body shapes. To serve consumers fully, we realized we had to adapt our advanced technology to bring inclusive principles into the design process to help brands create and adapt fashion for all women's body shapes. wanted you to get a, see, get a sense for just how easy it is. 
So let's see what a merchandiser can do with this. Working from a selection of inspirational, trend, and archival images, original fashion designs are automatically created. Our visual creative pad paradigm, along with edit panels here are seen on the bottom. And our aesthetic analytics preserves brand DNA. Habitude makes inclusivity easy for designers and merchandisers while assuring comprehensive consumer coverage. Now going further, our research tells us that half of women describe shopping as a chore and painful, and 83% say that they want to customize branding, they want to say in customizing branded clothing for their own shape. We have, patent, we have partnered with product development and manufacturing software powerhouse Gerber Technology as the front end for their on-demand made-to-measure platform for D2C on a shared revenue basis. Savitude's technology is also available as a SaaS subscription license fee to be used by designers and merchandisers who can save at least four weeks in product development and make their consumers happier because everyone can find beautiful clothes that fit them. And we would love to work with you and we would look forward to your feedback. Thank you. Early in the uh, inclusive design space. So we very much appreciate it. Thanks. Melissa, I think you have a question for Camilla. Yes, I do. Uh, nice to see you, Camilla. Um, see you. I'd, I'd like to talk to you. I don't think I've ever gotten deep into this product. I know we've talked so many times, but um, are you actually helping the retailer uh, create the clothing in terms of like the um, the merchandise or is it more about just helping them uh, with the sizing on the website? Uh, so for the re, re so this, uh, this technology can be used many different ways. So for a retailer, it can be used in on-demand consumer co-creation. Um, so, and it can be used also to help them buy a, the, a broad enough assortment so that they can actually serve their entire customer base. So I would, so it depends on how that retailer is in business. Our, so right now we are targeting both use cases of um, the uh, consumer coverage. And so that would be the buying application and also on demand if they're in that, that business space. Perfect. I, yeah, I did want to know about the, the different use cases. So that makes yes. a lot of sense. Thank so you. We're only in those two use cases right now. That's what we're selling into, yes. Where, where are you, um, Camilla, in terms of product market fit right now? Are mainly smaller designers or large enterprise? You mentioned a big ROI for a top five designer, I think you said earlier. So that was a top that, that that reference was with our recommendation technology. So that was making reference when I first met Deborah, um, and that was our recommendation product. Um, and so we went with the experience there. We went back into development, and we're just coming out of our development phase again. And right now we've partnered with Gerber Technology. So we're just now re-entering the marketplace. Well, to drill in a little further, what do you see as like the lowest hanging fruit in terms of the, the customers that would adopt the most quickly? Right, so we're looking after the, um, those that are uh, ahead in, um, you know, with, with digitally advanced. So those that are, um, you know, direct to consumer brands, um, the, so the newer brands. Um, so certainly it's a really not the individual designer um, because typically they really like designers designing. That's what they, that's what they're doing. Um, so uh, the direct to consumer new businesses um, that are probably venture backed. Um, uh, uh, Le some luxury uh, customers um, in uh, consumer coverage because they want to sell more um, and reach more customers. And a lot of their customers are uh, not really hourglass shaped. Um, and then um, and uh, also in Gen Z uh, serving customers. 
Yeah, I think actually, David, it's a good question. What we're seeing actually in the East is this whole idea, right, of CDM, CDM, right, customer to manufacturer. And so I think, uh, you know, talking to Camilla and especially working with Gerber, who's right, set up these micro factories, I, I think that, you know, they're, they're very far ahead in terms of thinking about CDM as it looks in the West. And so I think these are great questions. And it does usually, what we're seeing, at least in the East, is it really starts with kind of these D2C brands, but then eventually can move kind of into more, more traditional retailers and designers. Uh, Rob, quick question. Yeah, I have one. So thank you. Uh, thank you for your time. Great presentation. A quick question in regards to, you talked quite a bit about the, the data that you have and using the data, influencing the assortment and the buying. You know, one of the challenges that retailers have today is around differentiation around that local product and assortment. The data that you're collecting, how are you feeding that back to the retailers to, uh, to influence the localization of the product, uh, either around fit, style, trends, et cetera? So one of the things um, that we have is from our recommendation technology is there's a, we have a quiz um, where we get not uh, anonymized data. So all we get are body shape and, and city zip code associated with the customer. Um, and so we get localized data and we've you know looked at it by city across the, the US and it is very different by city. Um, and, uh, and so we can make supply chain recommendations based on that data. Great. Thank and so you. I would imagine, um, so we haven't done the data, but I would imagine that as that day, I'm actually recommending that that data become public, that we all, you know, people gather and pull that data publicly, but we retailers, brands own their own personal data that on that because yours would be different. I mean, I think some of this has to be standardized, frankly, so that sizing gets under control. And I think if we all pull together, that's how we control it. That's a, uh, a, a great vision and a huge task to have, no doubt. So thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Camilla and to all of our presenters today, we're going to invite our judges to the virtual deliberation room. And in the meantime, we're gonna shift gears to our emerging retail brand spotlight. To kick things off, I'd like to welcome Samara Walker, founder and CEO of Audubee. Hi everyone, my name is Samara Walker and I'm the CEO and founder of Audubee. Audubee is a luxury vegan nail lacquer brand created to reimagine the way women of color experience beauty in a digital newfound way. I founded Audubee because I really wanted to empower women through beauty and tech while bridging the gap in fashion by showcasing women of color from an editorial focal point within our luxury beauty, vegan beauty products. The problem, we all know disproportionate access is a real thing. Minority markets have $3.9 trillion in buying power, but yet we're still underserved when it comes to luxury, clean beauty products. Different shades, product offerings, and the brand messaging is just not there. We're misrepresented were misrepresented across various products. And then oftentimes women of color are not at the forefront when creating these beauty products. Therefore, there's no product alignment for various skin tones or undertones. And also the lack of inclusivity. And this is re in regards to product market marketing. There's no reflection within the branding, product selections or retail distribution points. And therefore there's a huge access factor. Our solution, authentic representation across our diverse products. Our products are a true reflection of all women through our branding, product design, and more. We have inclusive products with tech for skin tone alignment. Customers will be able to experience products in real time to make sure that they fit their skin tone and recognition, and also our enriched experiences. We are always creating experiences through our current and past relationships. For example, like New York Fashion Week, we're focusing on highlighting women of color through an editorial focal point. The current market size is worth $532 billion. So how do we stack up against some of our competitors in the space? We ought to be are focusing on providing professionals and retailers with the proper tools to service their customers with products and services. Our business models, product expansion, retail distribution, and also partnerships. Here's our ought to be executive team. Coupled with 15 plus years experience in finance, fashion, and tech, we are positive we can grow and scale ought to be. Here's our timeline of success. The ought to be edge you ask, we offer virtual beauty for product alignment. We're capturing the untapped market, which is often forgot about. And also we offer diverse education for our retailers. Here's some of our current traction to date. 
With the pandemic, with the pandemic, our business has grown tremendously and it provided exposure to us due to the increased demand for natural clean beauty nail products. In summary, our overall goal is continue to push the needle forward and we pride ourselves on always pushing inclusion and going beyond the bottle. We are more than just a beauty brand. We're here to create experiences for everyone. We are looking, to, we are looking forward to partner with more retailers and grow our business and provide access for our customers. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce Tim Reeser, co-founder of Fifth and Cherry. Hi, how are you? Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, we create a very uh, unique product, even though you might think it's a cutting board. Uh, it, it came about because the kitchen for me uh, growing up was the center of all activity. And so I can remember a time uh, growing up with my mother uh, cooking and I still have her, uh, her rolling pin. And every time I use it, I, I get transported right back to a time where I was making sugar cookies with her as a six year old little boy and coconut macaroons. And in today's uh, disposable society, there's very few things that have that right now in our lives. And so if you think about it, like when, you know, unfortunately the people that we do um, make our memories with our loved ones, you know, in 15 or 20 years, where are they going to be? You know, unfortunately some of them aren't gonna be with us. And so you're gonna go back to a Facebook post or an Instagram post and remember uh, those people. But if you cook with your loved one, uh, the opportunity to pull your cutting board out every day and remember them. That to me represents tangibility. We're taking memories and making them tangible. So it's not just a cutting board. It's the only cutting board in the world that's actually at scale, hand clamped and glued, steel reinforced. It won't crack. It won't warp. It's serialized. So you know what's yours. And then this part that we do that ensures that your memories can be handed down from with someone it's typically an act of love even though you might do it every day uh it's a really uh it's an accumulation of memories and when that person may or may not be gone or you want to remember that gift that's a big deal that you pull it out and you get transported right back in time and so next slide please and so uh with covid uh, i believe the world has come to where my heart has always been. I mean, gone to the frivolous and the superfluous. I think that we're connecting more. And, but that's, uh, look, I was a Marine. I deployed three times to Iraq as a Marine Corps uh, aviator. I am very acutely aware of the fragility of life. And, and oftentimes the only things we have left are the memories that we created together. It's not physical items, it's memories. And our boards, our products, the way they're designed, they keep those alive forever. And so with COVID, because of the community that surrounds Fifth and Cherry, we were able to, we didn't have to close the shop except by order of the governor. We created boards in Reading, Pennsylvania. We didn't have to lay off anyone. The gentleman um, in one of the photos you see, I grew up in this shop making, uh, sweeping the floors at this guy at his feet. Uh, we are a company that's been around forever and now we're on a national level and it is amazing. Next slide, please. And so uh, in terms of, do we want help? Absolutely. We need help amplifying our message. 18% of our customers are repeat customers. We didn't create a product that you buy once. If you go on the Fifth and Cherry's website, it's actually aimed at gift givers. The cutting board industry is only a $31 million industry, but the gift giving industry is $136 billion. People are giving these as gifts every day. We're transforming what this is becoming. And so that is a huge opportunity for us to grow. We welcome help. We welcome teamwork. We want to grow. So if you're interested, we please reach out to us. The next step for us is Custom Kitchen, something we've been doing for years on a national level. And rarely do you have the time, or excuse me, rarely do you have the opportunity to become the dominant brand in something that's existed forever. But most folks cannot name a national brand that makes cutting boards and chopping blocks or custom kitchens we together can have the opportunity to do that. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And thank you, Stephen. I really appreciate you letting me go a few seconds over there. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Tim. In a, you know, in a current COVID world where uh, many are, are starved for personal connection, uh, I can definitely see why a company like Fifth and Cherry would be so relevant right now. Next emerging brand, we have Ben Jablonski uh, from Good Charcoal Company. Hey guys, uh, thanks so much, Stephen. I'm Ben Jablonski from the Good Charcoal Company. And I'm here to tell you why good food deserves good charcoal. The good charcoal is good for three reasons. One, 
our charcoal is the hottest on the market. We get up to 1300 degrees Fahrenheit because our charcoal is made from a special wood only found in Africa. It means that a 15 pound bag of our charcoal is equivalent to a 25 pound bag of the leading brand. Number two, we're good for America. As a brand found in COVID, every week we are hosting free barbecues for families experiencing food insecurity around America. And number three, we're good for the environment. We are tackling an environmental problem called bush encroachment. That's how we get our wood. And the Forestry Stewardship Council, the FSC, has called our charcoal the greenest charcoal in the world. So Rob and I, as you can see in that picture, are close friends and we're co-founders. We've been cooking together for years. And when we saw COVID happen, we wanted to make a new charcoal company to help people cook, but also help families in need. That took us on a crazy journey, four flights to Namibia, Africa, in November of last year, where we made a deal with some of the leading charcoal producers there and um, also partnered with USAID to sort of help uh, the communities in need out there as well. But we have the hottest charcoal in ample supply. Namibia's charcoal is the most sustainably sourced in the world. Uh, our charcoal is uh, BSCI certified and FSC, uh, as you can see in the bottom right of this slide, have named Namibian charcoal the greenest charcoal in the world. Every week around the country, uh, we are doing free barbecues to help hungry Americans. As you can see on the news, there are two mile long lines for food around this country, and we're doing our part to help uh, solve problems. Uh, I'll be in the South uh, next month uh, doing barbecues in Arkansas, and I welcome any retail partners that want to help uh, in solving this problem to join us and partner with us in doing that. So finally, uh, you can see the logo, the Good Charcoal Company. It's like a note from a friend inviting you to come have a barbecue. Uh, the, the product is great. It burns hotter. You can see the back of the bag, our Feed America program. I invite you to be in touch uh, to help us grow this company. And I really appreciate the opportunity to present today. Uh, good food deserves good charcoal. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Ben, and, and appreciate everything you're doing uh, and, and definitely the, uh, the sustainability and charitable but functional uh, product that you guys have developed. So thank you. And now, without further ado, I'm going to move to the prizes. Uh, for the audience, we have given away three prizes for all of your participation. Um, the first goes to Dexter Newman from Target, who will receive an item from Fifth and Cherry. Second, we have Jenna Chan from Walmart, from Audubee. Uh, and then we have Christina uh, uh, Leek from Sephora, uh, who will also be receiving an item. And now just in, we have our, our winner elected by the judges. And we have, uh, we have come to the conclusion that Inspectorio is the winner. So David Klein, congratulations. Just want to pass over the the video to you if you have any uh, you know words to say uh, uh, winning this this competition. Thank you, Stephen, thank you, Deborah. Thank you to the judges and to everybody that participated. Uh, this is extremely exciting and, and a huge honor. You know, from the very beginning of founding the company, we've had a consistent mission of truly a bringing a, the interconnected nature of our supply chain. A, into uh, a digital solution that reflects that, that allows factories, vendors, brands, and retailers to truly cooperate, to truly maximize the resources um, and start collaborating in a pre-competitive environment. Um, it feels very uh, great to uh, have this recognition and, and to know that uh, we continue to push forward in this journey uh, to, to shape and make the industry more transparent more efficient um, and ultimately making um, the world better by it as well. So um, thank you so much. Uh, very, very exciting. Thank you, David. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, huge pleasure. I invite anybody um, in the audience, of course, if you wanna hear more about what we do and, and what's uh, coming in 2021, we have a very new exciting developments and, and, and products. Um, so feel free to reach out. Um, and again, uh, thank you, uh, Corsite, for, for making uh, incredible content. I, I keep on saying that um, you're contributing immensely uh, as well. Thank you. Thanks, David. And uh, thanks, Stephen. Stephen, I'll leave it to you for closing remarks. 
Yeah, thank you, David. And thank you to all our amazing presenters who continue to push the innovation needle forward. I also want to thank all of our judges for joining us today. And of course, you know, you, the audience for, for tuning in. Uh, we hope to see you all next week for our Placer AI webinar taking place Tuesday. And have a great rest of your day and looking forward to seeing you all next time.